Hello everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Development eTalk series co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management Indore. It is indeed an honor to have with us today Dr. Hema Divakar as our keynote speaker. Dr. Divakar is a senior technical advisor to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India and medical director of Divakar Speciality Hospital in Bengaluru. And in fact, she dons too many caps and I'm sure heavy is the head which has so many responsibilities on it. She has been the past president of FOXI, the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India. She's co-chair of speciality groups of FIGO, that is the Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics on Diabetes in, Pregna uh, on diabetes in Pregnancies and NCDs. And she leads the FIGO COVID-19 task force also. The list of awards conferred upon her is just too long for me to recite the whole of it, but I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, she has the Women Achievers Award uh, for 2015 by FIGO's, FIGO Lifetime Achievement Awards by Diabetes and Pregnancy Study Group of India and Lifetime Achievement Award by Karnataka State Gynecologists Association and Bangalore Obstetrics and Gynecological Society and Fellowship of UK's Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Dr. Devakar will share her insights on preventing illness and promoting wellness for girls and women. A very good afternoon to Dr. Hema Devakar from the students of Indian Institute of Management in the it is indeed a great honor to have you here in the Sustainable Development eTalk. We are certainly looking forward to learning about promoting wellness among women and girls. Thanks for joining us. Over to you, ma'am. Namaskar. Thank you very, very much. Everything about SDGs is about breaking the silos. So this is one of the rare occasions where we as PGYNs are really, really wanting to break the silos speak only about technical uh, issues within our own sphere, not speak only to each other, but to make things happen with the philosophy of connect and collaborate. So uh, just allow me a minute to share the slides. And it is SSNS, CNS ends with an S. So it is Y-E-S, S for me, <laughs> which is uh, the challenges in the present era, which we so much want to face bravely. Shobaji, yes. that begins with the S again. Yeah. She is a real doer and much inspired with all your work, Shobaji. And yeah. I'm confessing it in the uh, open Hi. today, being a silent spectator of what you do. Then her surname ends with Shukla, another S. So are we all ready saying yes, yes, and yes to do a lot more and contribute a bit. So this is one situation where I will be speaking about SDG3. And it's all about uh, good health and well-being. Being in the women's healthcare space, I have said good health and well-being for girls and women because mostly that is what we deal with. But through them, you will recognize as we move along that not only the present generation, but the generations to come should and will remain good health and ensure their well-being. So that is the philosophy of what we are going to roll and unravel and see how best we can come together to do our best. So thanks again to Shobaji, to Bobby, to CNS, to I am Indoor and all the viewers who are <clears throat> with us this fine afternoon to yet again recognize health is wealth. As the Prime Minister has said, Jan hai, Jahan hai. So the key importance of how you have to safeguard health the ongoing coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic is really creating the biggest havoc ever that one would have faced in the spheres of health, economy and social crisis, which has confronted us in living memory. When it all ends, it will indeed 
leave behind bruised and battered health systems, economies, individual families, the society at large, and across the world. The biggest impact, no doubt, will be on the economy and health systems, and there will be a need to reassess the priorities in health and the way we access the way we deliver healthcare. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the finest moments. If you look at it with another perspective, pull up our socks and at our own house, right? With respect to the aspects that we are going to unravel as we go along. So, the population health, the disease surveillance, the preventive care, the most likely dominate the agenda of the international development agencies as well as the local, regional, and national governments. So, the best for me is to speak about what we may expect and to make the change happen to be the change that we want to see good health and well-being preventing illness and promoting wellness for girls and women the vision 2022 as declared by our organization artist it expands as asian research and training institute for skill transfer says we follow the life course approach indeed at every given opportunity in life we have to prevent illness and promote wellness and we at artists want to do more and more to see the change in women's health care in india we are determined to harness our mutual strengths of human resources whilst we strive to make a change our vision is way beyond mbg5 way beyond 2015 we want to address new and emerging health issues with many more angles added to it in the present pandemic I truly believe that India has gone a long way in improving the healthcare services for women, but it just made a beginning of having the hope to much more than what we have done by our own Jugard innovations and research, which is an implementation research, the research that we can do in our own country to see what works for us. And these areas will further enhance the public policy efforts. So our pathway from innovation to implementation is the key to what we are going to deliberate. Let me say SDG 3, good health and well-being. Well, what does that really mean? You know, there, there was way back, you know, five years back when we used to say SDG to our obstetric and gynecologist community, many would not relate that it is sustainable development goals. When we used to say NCD, oh, it must be National Commission for HEMA works in diabetes space, so it may be National Commission for Diabetes, NCD, or you know, things like that. The concept of how big the canvas is and how little we know about it is also the first act to recognize within our own community. And we pledge that the health and well being of people at all ages lies at the Part of the sustainable development goals. Protection from disease is not only fundamental to survival, as I said, Jan hai to Jahan hai, but it enables opportunity for everyone and strengthens the economic growth and prosperity. So when we say women and reproduction, it is the health and the production which is also in the picture. So the key, key aspects of the SDG good health and well-being that I'm going to focus in my talk. Day is one is the 3.8 that is achieve universal health coverage everyone everywhere every time should have access to the minimal they can and the best they can that is the concept of universal health coverage centerpiece of course is maternal and newborn mortality the aspect that we have been struggling through as OBGYNs to do our best for targets 3.1 and 3.2 the sdg3 first of all the recognition that the ncd tsunami is going to be what we will face next the 3.4 target of the sdg that is reduce the mortality from non-communicable diseases and promote mental health and well-being cardiovascular diseases the cancers the diabetes Every family is familiar with these terms. Why? Because somebody known to them and many times somebody within their own family is having one of the situations and therefore these have become 
the part and parcel of a family member, if I may say. So the 17 SDG goals, if you put the goal two and three together, and if you see the graph here, that in comparison to other goals, when you put two, that is the zero hunger and good health and well-being, the blue bar indicates where we are at the moment, and the orange bar indicates where we are likely to be in 2030. So we are likely to be far ahead, 90% or more, actually really making our best attempts to work towards these two goals. But look at the last line, Ethiopia. To start with, it is behind India, but they are perhaps working on some things which will make them run the race faster and reach a greater scale by 2030. So we need to learn from the other countries as well, not only the developed countries, but also the developing countries about how they may have worked their way out to see these kind of projections, learn lessons from them and adapt to the same. Once more, I emphasize that we need to take silos with the different compartments. For example, the uh, SDG 17 features are really, really interconnected. We have 169 targets and 232 indicators. But there is an invisible integration and I will bring that to the focus as we move along. And the sectors, various sectors, the health sector maybe, the economic sector, the social sector, educational sector, all the sectors have to come together necessarily because none of these pieces of good health can be seen in isolation. For example, you just take the nutrition and basic medical care, or SDG 2 and 3 that we mentioned, access to basic knowledge and the question of human rights, water and sanitation, again so well integrated with the health and wellness, access to information, communication, freedom and choice, but health and wellness also depending on shelter and inclusiveness of the entire society and all the stakeholders, the environmental quality and access to advanced education. So everything is woven with one another. So we need to break the silos and see holistically and comprehensively how we will be able to get to the bottom of the problem with all the stakeholders joining hands. For public health measures, we need to increase awareness, access, affordability, acceptance of in the women's health care, the counseling and the care, especially with respect to nutrition, which the government is now paying very, very keen attention to, even prior to uh, her getting uh, pregnant and the prenatal, postnatal services, which need to be prioritized. So, by access to health care. Yes, that is one of the SDG goals and everything everywhere should be available. This does not mean that only the infrastructure has to exist. We have to strengthen the capacities of every provider within the system, inclusive of the supply chain management, inclusive of the access to the healthcare and inclusive of the um, insurance and other affordability averages that we can bring. So would you want to make a difference in this space? Yes, certainly you can do your bit because no matter what your profile is, you can lend a strong helping hand in making this happen. And we fully believe that everybody has a role to play. Protection from preventable diseases. I bring this uh, point about the vaccine for you because it's a couple of years since the HPV vaccine against the cervical cancer is available in the country. Today, we are counting down the number of months or years before the COVID-19 vaccine comes into the market. But whatever is already available to us as on today, has it been used sufficiently with enough awareness when we walk towards tomorrow. These are our young girls who will truly, as a matter of their right, deserve preventive care in terms of 
HPV or the cervical cancer vaccination, it is our duty to see to it that not only the awareness, but the accessibility and to bring down the cost so that every girl, every woman needs to be counted and we need to kill the cancer cervix before it kills us. Coming to the age group, which is a little beyond that because cervical cancer vaccine is available and it is for girls the earliest you can give between 10 to 15 years as they progress into their adolescence can we not put our heads down in shame when we know that there are 13 million abortions happening every single year in our country Not all of them are adolescents even the married women whether there is a lack of uh, access to contraceptive care or whether there is uh, uh, insensitive casual attitude towards uh, abortion and they may think in a moment that so what if it happens I can have it aborted but 13 million is a mind-boggling number. Here again we say that when 20 percent per thousand adolescents happen this is mostly studies have shown it's because of the school dropouts. They drop out of school, the education is not complete and the next best thing that the parents will do is to get a young adolescent married and there is no contraception available within the first year she gets pregnant and this is the scale of the problem. So by 2030, as for the SDG goals, we have to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive care services, including family planning, information, education, and integrate this into national strategies and programs. Because education of the girls, Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, is really it's more stronger it needs to be vocal than what it is today because again we have brought it to your notice breaking the silos how interconnected they are the zero hunger the elimination of poverty the access to education gender equity which is SDG 5 all of them comprehensively a role in preventing illness and promoting wellness in this age group as well. So attention needs to be paid to the fact that as OBGYNs, we may just make the abortion service available. Not good enough because the advocacy around it, the education promotion to the girls so that they are well aware of what how the responsible behavior should be, health and hygiene programs in several schools. Every sector has to do their bit to make this happen real real scale of the problem lies in the unnecessary preventable deaths both the mother who dies while giving life or in a child which is less than five years old and because of poor nutrition etc half of the number of children are lost because of hunger so zero hunger and providing nutrition again becomes an important component here it's not just enough to Produce, but you have to bring up the children well so that they survive and thrive. Maternal deaths, young women 22 24 years, and preventable causes, but she's losing her life. And why does this happen? And what can we do about it? Again, the SDG goal is a safe and healthy birth from the mother to the child. Pregnancy, indeed, is a risky journey. Professional support, which does not mean an OBGYN support, it means a skilled frontline healthcare provider who is competent to conduct safe delivery. That is the definition of a professional support to everybody delivering everywhere. So the this is a low-hanging fruit, and if we do a little bit more than what we are doing, I think a dream of achieving. 70 per 100,000 by births by 2030, that is the projection. I think we will be able to uh, achieve uh, that as a uh, attempt that is already uh, in the pipeline with the public and private sector joining hands to do more. And let me speak a little more about how we have walked the talk. I strongly believe that where you live should never ever determine if you will live at all or no. A woman delivering in a metro city of Bangalore has several times more chances for complications if she runs into it, being tackled 
from a competent setting and she will survive and thrive. The same women, she was in the interior remote parts of Jharkhand, for example, there's every likelihood that several fall times she would have had perhaps a chance not to survive because surely because of inadequacy of care. So every person everywhere deserves every opportunity to survive and thrive. So what did we do about it? The organization that I was mentioning, the artist, we taken a nationwide resolve for skill transfer and capacity enhancement initiatives to ensure the competency and skills for the frontline maternal and child health care delivery staff. The task shifting is so, so, so very crucial because we have 30 million deliveries per year in our country and we need a workforce of 1 million healthcare providers. So you see here that the task shifting is happening to the frontline healthcare providers. There is hands-on competency building, training the paramedic and the teams in the hospital from the interiors of Rajasthan, Assam, UP, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra. We are really on a mission to save lives and collaborating to skill India is in keeping with our vision 2022. And I do believe it's important. Uh, if it's really important to us, we will find a way. If not, we'll only be finding excuses. So, uh, dear friends, we made every attempt to collaborate and break the silos, and invite partners both in the private and the public sector and with Johns Hopkins Public Health Team, is Japaigo, Oxy, our parent organization, MacArthur Foundation, which lent support for the program management unit and MSD for mothers whose vision was to invest in the private sector because 70% of the care, maternal health care is given to the private, given by the private sector, the public-private partnership to do more in this space. So we embarked on a program called Manyata, which is our vision to ensure that no women will die during childbirth. It is really a dream come true because Manyata is today a reality and not just a promise. To ensure a safe quality delivery with dignity and respect is the mission Manyata. And now the digital platform available to us for the teaching and training. When I say Assam, Risa, interiors of Rajasthan, and uh, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, UP, we are reaching to every nook and corner with these in the last two years with the digital platform. And there were many skeptics in our own field who would believe that much could not be achieved by this, but the very fact the killing was done in a very novel way a very practical way and the assessment proved that we were scoring anywhere between 94 to 100% retraining refreshing everything happening seamlessly with ease on the digital platform now the whole world as how today you and me speak and uh, see each other on across the geographic boundaries everybody has jumped into the wagon but yes now they believe that it is so doable in fact, it is the only way where we will be able to scale up. So we have digitized the entire system uh, to, as of now, 1,000 private hospitals span India uh, with more than 1 lakh beneficiaries have got into the system. Teams of the hospital come on the digital platform, get the skill transfer for the 16 clinical standards of safe delivery. It is executed and re-rehearsed and re-revised surveillance and monitoring evaluation done time and again. So the scores of 20 reach the scores of 90 to 100, which means that preventable complications are prevented, the transmission rates are minimal, the emergency transfers are really, really minuscule, and many, many lives of the mothers and the babies are in. So this is one fine example of how we are generating evidences from our flagship program called Manyata in order to make accessible, affordable, 
care through skilled healthcare providers by the task shifting. We have tied up with the government of Maharashtra uh, for the Lakshmanyata initiative, the improvement piece, learning lessons from there, sharing it with the other Asian countries as well, the clinical care, the business module that we are developing, robust use of technology, strategic partnerships and certification and accreditation has made us move several, several steps ahead. So therefore I come back to the sentence where there is a will, there is a way, otherwise there's only excuses. So we wanted to make it happen and it is now a reality. But as I said in my opening remark, the long journey begins with one step. One step has been taken because we need to go to the scale of 1 million healthcare providers and we really need everybody's help who can uh, pitch in their efforts to do their component in this puzzle of breaking the silos. The last issue, the universal healthcare, turning dreams into reality, the maternal and child care by skilling, and last of all, the non-communicable diseases how to reduce mortality from there, how to ensure um, wellness and good health, how to prevent illness. These are the lines that all of us must underline, underscore and pay attention to. Maternal and child health are inextricably linked with CDs and the risk factors. Because in a sense, non-communicable diseases are communicable from the mother to the child in her womb. And it's the intergenerational transfer of all these programming of cardiovascular diseases, the diabetes and chronic illnesses happen. And intergenerational impact of poor maternal nutrition and health conditions during the pregnancy, particularly the NCD related pregnancy complications, can be considered as a multiplier of the ongoing of pandemic of NCDs. So it is very, very crucial for us when we say safe deliveries, it also means that we are identifying at-risk mothers and their offsprings. Interventions to address the NCDs in pregnancies have beneficial on the short-term pregnancy outcomes. That's a given. Okay, the mother will be well, baby will be well, take home baby, take home mother, it doesn't end there. Even more importantly, identify the at-risk mothers and offsprings, which can open up the opportunity for targeted early preventive action forever and forever in their life. That's what we mean by the life course approach. The preventive actions that you take in the mother and child space will address the long-term issues in the offspring of obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and so on and so forth, which have a common lifestyle approach. Identifying one of these problems in pregnancy provides us an opportunity to address them all. The maternal and offspring health, how it is linked to the future of CDs. This is not only an interesting concept, but it is a real concept which gives us ample opportunity if our thinking and vision is beyond the short-term outcomes. For maternal nutrition and health during pregnancy is considered a multiplier for ongoing pandemic of NCDs, particularly in countries like ours. It provides a cross bridge for undernutrition in one generation, to transit into overweight and obesity in the next generation, to, for example, gestational hyperglycemia and macrosomia. This impacts the subsequent generations of Offsprings, that is the generation next with the issues of overweight, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, etc. So, the vicious cycle goes like this. Poor maternal health increases the risk of NCDs in the offsprings. Subsequent generation, these NCDs lead to again the poor maternal health in the next generation, setting the vicious cycle of the intergenerational transfers on and on and on. I'll give you some mind boggling numbers. Approximately 130 million pregnancies globally. And out of these, about 10 to 14 percent, estimated 21 million are affected by high blood sugars or hyperglycemia in pregnancy. 
seven to eight million of these hypertensives, 42 million of the mothers are overweight and obese. 26 million of the mothers have undernutrition and 56 million have maternal anemia. Not only do these conditions increase the risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes in the short term, but also the prenatal morbidity and mortality, which is to be considered as a short term outcome, but they also identify both the mother and this offspring who are at really, really high risk for the future diabetes, future obesity. For example, if this mother is having high sugar in her pregnancy, not tested, not screened, not managed properly, is a forerunner, two to five years, she becomes a full-blown type diabetic. What about her offspring? It's programmed in a high sugar environment. By the time the child becomes 10 years, it's an obese child. By the time it goes to early adulthood, 20, 22 years, the child may also have type 2 diabetes. Such is the importance of paying attention to the pregnancy segment and having all these comorbidities under our control. And we have to ensure in the vision 2022, at the minimum, all the pregnant women attending our healthcare facilities be tested with respect to hyperglycemia or high sugars, if we tested by a single set test, Hypertension, yes, the BP measure is not, anemia needs to be under control. All of these things which I mentioned in the previous slides, we need to pay much more attention to these and have our handle on that right at that juncture. The high-risk mother and child pair post such delivery should be encouraged for all of forever and forever and forever. If the mother is coming for child's vaccination, again, we have to collaborate with the pediatrician, with the silos, and pre-check on the mother's sugar status as well. So what does this translate to? Even in developed countries, again, coming back to the issue of COVID, you would notice that in New York State, 86% of the deaths in the ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic is because of the comorbid situations of NCDs. Many of them who have died necessarily have diabetes or hypertension or obesity or cardiovascular disease, etc. So when there was a discussion on a television show, said, oh, this may not be a problem in India because uh, we have a great population who are bigger than 60 years of age. Yes, we do have uh, significant numbers, less than 60, but many of them are already having diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular diseases which multiplies their problems and risk for fatality with infections such as COVID. So post-COVID world, prevention and care of NCDs absolutely, absolutely have to be prioritized. You go for a COVID test, please also give your sample for a blood sugar test, for example, have your BP checked because there are so many undiagnosed uh, in the population with respect to these chronic diseases. So this may be well an opportunity to have control on them and prevent illness and promote wellness. And what better place to begin all these initiatives than where life begins. We have to integrate sexual reproductive maternal child health care programs to the non-communicable disease prevention and control. Because what we pick up in the pregnancy, if you have a continuum of care throughout her life, particularly the target who had all these comorbidities in pregnancy, just like a sample, one jhalak, it has shown you this woman is going to be prone to all of these. So you can definitely institute the preventive care at the primary health care level. So these programs need to need to talk to each other and get our act together to integrate the maternal and child health care with the NCD prevention care. So uh, uh, the time will permit me to just discuss one example of diabetes in pregnancy in Asia as an outstanding example of how this will impact and reduce the burden of future non-communicable diseases which has to be considered as a priority area of maternal health. As I have explained, there is no harm in saying once more that there's a huge risk of intergenerational transfer, massive changes in the food habits, sedentary lifestyle, not only the diabetes and pregnancy is on the rise, the risk of passing the disease to an unborn child 
its future is also proportionately rising. With about four to five million women in our own country getting affected every single year, three million of them will convert into type two diabetes. So every year we are producing potentially two to three million pregnant women who in two to five years will turn into type two diabetes unless they were very well managed in their pregnancy and had a long-term follow-up. Alarming portion of children born to these are also succumbing to childhood obesity and early onset diseases. Significant portion of these can be prevented with the right approach in pregnancy because it all begins in the womb. Our campaigns, our trainings, our awareness programs focusing on diabetes in pregnancies using the life course approach. What do we mean by life course approach to prevention? The best time to invest. You see on the vertical bar here, risk of NCDs. If the mother and the child are taken care of really, really well, we test every pregnant woman for high blood sugar. We control her sugars. We manage her forever and forever in preventive healthcare space. The child which is programmed in a normal sugar mother, again, is not going to be prone to obesity and early childhood. CD. So early intervention, if you see on the horizontal bar, if you have invested enough in the mother and child care, the NCD proportion will be far lesser. If you keep track of these, if you miss the opportunity, childhood and adolescence, you do not allow them to be obese, you put them into a lifestyle module, then the proportion of NCD is a little bit higher than before, still it is far lesser. In adulthood, every of these pregnant women act and face and uh, early interventions till you are a little bit more better. But if you don't do anything about this, you just see the scale of NCD as how it is happening now. So let's not lose the opportunities to do our best because pregnancy does offer a window of opportunity not only to provide maternal and child health care services, but Beyond reducing the traditional maternal perinatal mortality, morbidity, also reduces the intergenerational transmission of NCDs. So when we say that let's do this and let's do that, we have to strengthen the health system. Just as I said in the maternal healthcare space, how we are task shifting, how we are skilling thousands and hundreds and thousands and million healthcare workforce we have to be taught what to do. It's not good asking people to do something they, for which they don't have equipment, they have time to do or they don't have enough knowledge. So we have got to again figure out how we will do it in our own country, how we will see to it that every pregnant woman is given this minimal care, keeping the long-term NCD point of view. The preventive care which is an ample opportunity in this space. Again, healthcare providers training, Supply chain management guidelines, specific to our country context. I'm glad that the government of India has brought out of the amended guidelines as well uh, for the gestational diabetes care in our own country. The referrals and the linkages between this group and the CD group, everything has to be. Again, when I say the SDG 3 addresses this health and well being, but the component of gender equity, which is also one of the SDG goals. See how it merges, how the concept of breaking the silos and getting these issues together is so very crucial for holistic care. There are gender equity issue, still poor services and inequity gives rise to so many detrimental consequences for the women, negligence of women's health, low awareness, stigmatization, because they don't want in their engage to say that their sugars are high and they hide the fact and hop from one doctor to another and not wanting to reveal it to their own family even practices and perceptions of weight, diet, eat for two, you know, even though the sugars are high. All of these are, uh, you know, real concerns and the gender equity issues also come to the forefront in delivering the universal health care. There are barriers to the gestational diabetes care where diet forms a most important component and zero hunger, removal of poverty, access to health care. You can see how all the SDG goals are merging complementary to each other. It's not good enough if we tackle one vertical alone but we have to comprehensively get our act together. Simple things 
Don't say breastfeeding is the best feeding. But a diabetic in pregnancy should be told that if she feeds for 10 months breastfeeding, then the decrease in the risk of diabetes two years after delivery is reduced by more than 60%. So that is a simple thing to say. It's so doable. But the patient has to be sensitized to this bit of information. Lifestyle interventions, easily said than done. The clinicians are not saying it with as much conviction or pragmatically or practically, but it is indeed a highly cost-effective method to treat uh, the long-term diseases. It seems intuitive that screening and comprehensive care for gestational diabetes should be highly cost-effective overall. If you not only see the short-term impact, but long-term uh, impact, even in the absence of a more cost-effective data. So uh, each of the population in our youth need the promotion of the lifestyle, especially the adolescent girls, pregnant women, to um, have their nutrition and limiting the adolescent pregnancy and get on to the physical activity to uh, have a comprehensive uh, uh, fitness uh, regime to prevent illness and promote wellness. Luckily, because of the extensive use of mobile technology, let's not say that access is not there. By the digital platform, if you make up your mind, you can really teach them even for simple advices, what to eat, when to exercise, and also pick the insulin dosages, etc. So a lot can be uh, done with the vast amount of uh, data that is generated. So it is said that it's not the new insulin that's going to change the diabetes treatment, it's the technology. Fair enough, you the patient cannot travel 200 miles to uh, come to your doorstep to give a fasting blood sugar sample, but maybe the technology, the way it can be accessed and cost effective, uh, right from wherever she is, the Bluetooth can uh, pick up the values and give the necessary advice. Going to the diabetes related mean expenditure, it impacts the economy so much. When we say the poverty lines have to be pinned out, Every poor family has one diabetic in their family. The investment on that person for their medical care and the medicines per se will be huge. So what the higher income countries are investing on the CD care, every individual family out of pocket expenses in our country just cannot afford to do that. So um, the CD prevention is worthwhile investing in don't let the diabetes come to the forefront i to invest maximum in the segment where this can be prevented in 2018 term at all noted additional investment of 1.5 uh, us dollars per capita would avert 15 million deaths 8 million incidents of ischemic heart disease and 13 million incidents of stroke in the selected 20 countries that they studied. So this itself proves investing in NCD prevention, where we from the women's healthcare space have to say it loud and clear, the best opportunity for NCD prevention in the future generations is the space of maternal and child healthcare. So investing there is integral to achieving sustainable development target of 3.4 is reducing the premature mortality from the NCDs by one third. So we can run the race faster than Ethiopia for sure if we pay attention to these comorbidities and tackle them well in the others. We the progress towards the SDG target 3.8, that is universal health care, is also to be actually executed. So again, taking the silo approach. Despite the clear and logic and health economic evidence, why is it the link between maternal health and prevention of NCD is continually neglected? Perhaps the silo approach. She's more than 45, she's hypertensive, she goes to a physician, she doesn't think it's linked to an OBGYN. OBGYN doesn't think that we ought to have a offered a long-term care for this pregnant patient who had hypertension in her pregnancy, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So the silo approach to health divides the healthcare delivery to communicable, non-communicable diseases, maternal child health and the other. It's not integrated and the concept, the new concept that we have to work for prevention of illness and promotion of wellness in keeping with the SDG3 
to break the silos and integrate. This division exists even within the maternal and child health care space. Postpartum follow up six weeks and then she's forgotten until she gets into a menopause phase. Every year, annual checkup for these women with comorbidities is not insisted upon. When she comes to for her child's care for vaccinations, then we don't see the mother most often. The reason is perhaps that health economic impact of addressing overall maternal health is addressed merely in terms of short term short term outcomes. Mother is alive, child is alive, good out. That's not it. We are going to change our concept here and now. And unless it is not integrated into the long-term impact of the future population, continual tracking, continual engaging, and empowering a healthy lifestyle is going to be the way forward. So, dear friends, health system priorities to be reconfigured as a global voice for women's health care. In our own space, we need to pay urgent attention to this area particularly in creating health economic evidence for an integrated approach to women, girls and women's health and CD prevention. When the health system priorities are reconfigured in the post-COVID-19 world. Silo mentality will have to be broken and this will transform the healthcare system. What better place, as I've said before, to begin this transformation than from where the life begins, that is right in the womb ensuring the health of the women before, during and after pregnancy and of course of their offsprings in a life course approach. It's not merely theoretical, but it's pragmatic and economical to the society. The approach that documents and proactively empowers the community to seek universal health care to pay more attention to the preventive health care. So all these, okay, this is one of us standing there saying, we often say, Connect the dots. Okay, here I must submit that it is not only a dot, it may be a triangle, a pentagon, a square, a circle, everything needs to be connected because it's like in totality it is so complex and yeah. everyone has changed the world just like you and me should have the conviction that even whatever bit we do will play a role ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. What has been achieved is indeed commendable because we have brought some figures down and we are well on our way to um, the forward movement towards the SDGs. But considering the sheer size of our country, what still needs to be done presents a huge challenge. As Baba Tunde said, Western healthcare workers, which we have, the Skill India mission is really to be seriously taken. Invest in societal protection with gender equity and issues such as those making universal health care available to all invest in the supply chain when she goes to the healthcare setting she must get what she needs there one of our best opportunities is health and wellness centers with the ayushman bharat scheme there is so much that can happen around this but as i said the partnership for knowledge and implementation robust it system medicines and supply chains, HR and multitasking, expanded service delivery, community mobilization, awareness creation, financial schemes, everything. Please break the silos and integrate. That is where I really congratulate the CNS, Shobaji and Bobby and the team for bring and I am in the bringing us together because we need to see each other's perspective and we need to see how best we can uh, cash on the existing situation to do our best. So in conclusion, I must submit humbly that there is more to understand, of course much more to do towards SDG3, ensuring healthy lives, promoting well-being for all, at all ages. Yes, dear friends, the momentum is building and we move from passion to purpose. Wish you all very, very well at all times in future to leave you satisfied about not only your thought processes but your actions towards preventing illness and promoting wellness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Hema ji for connecting the dots so well. You have bowled us completely and we at CNS have always believed that breaking the silos and integrating is so very important.
also we cannot deliver just on one or few of the sdgs uh, without achieving the rest as you have so clearly pointed out it's either all or none that's it and you also said very rightly that preventing illness and promoting wellness for girls and women is so very important to safeguard the health of men so the male audience we have today beware it's only for your own selfish interest that you have to protect the health of the women <laughs> we now open for question and answer session uh, participants please type in your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak and hema ji has given us enough food for thought i'm sure there are already lot many questions which have come up and so we will take them up and meanwhile the rest of you please put on your thinking cap and start typing in uh, swapna majumdar a very senior journalist uh, she wants to ask a question swapna would you like to ask yourself she has typed in her question in the chat box but if she wants to ask she can ask herself uh, please swapna ji hmm. okay uh, okay i will ask uh, i will just read that question what she has written uh, she says that uh, as a journalist writing on development and gender Uh, i have seen that a lack of gender equality is one of the biggest barriers to health and wellness for women i was wondering whether your program in hospitals also tracks violence against women and its impact on the health of them um both issues the gender equality violence against women are very key issues uh, uh, in uh, the skill transfer and the comprehensive delivery uh, for safe delivery in the, under the manyata scheme as well because um, uh, it is the team in the hospital which have to take this approach when they are approaching the women and sensitization when we build in to the soft skill curriculum of the course it's very difficult sometimes for us to ask up front and for the women to confess that there has been a domestic violence so there are some novel methodologies of uh, uh, dropping um, uh, some uh, uh, questions even uh, when she is uh, waiting in the wings for her checkup or uh, quietly the staff nurse asks some of these and taps the history so that we can uh, act upon it and uh, overall the education of the women and women themselves we convince that their health It's really important, not only for themselves, but for the entire family. That mindset is slowly changing. They have begun to give more importance to their own health because we always say your health is in your hands. And the more we talk about it, the more we empower the girls and women to believe that they need to be well, do a lot many more things for themselves and their family. that is the way forward so a little bit sensitization and tell because the gender equity will not just come by theory by rhetoric because we have to think and behave we ha- we always say in our school programs that girls and boys are different they are equal so that is that is the mantra that we you know uh, go with you know because we don't want to create rebels in the society by just you know saying that uh, the the kind of a different uh, Whether you call it feminist attitude or whatever shared name you may put, we don't want to create that kind of a uh, you know either a confusion, conflict, or turmoil. We have to just see every opportunity as an equal opportunity and move ahead, inclusive of preventive healthcare and baby. Right. So it has to be a rights-based approach, as you are saying, which is very yes. important. And uh, of course, very often there are. due to so many socio cultural reasons i think health seeking behavior of women is very poor uh, and as you are saying that that we have to come out of that ourselves and and in a very subtle manner and rights based approach as you have mentioned right means so rashmi kumar has a question to ask rashmi ji would you like to ask your question yourself just unmute yourself and ask you just give her a little time otherwise i will read her question Rashmi wants to know. Her question is more towards the uh, the difficulty for women to talk and convince their male partners to use options to prevent unintended pregnancies and STIs, sexually transmitted infections. So, madam, do you see some changes now 
in better uptake of male options or what more needs to be done so <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is one question which uh, we have always been asked because uh, there was a drive to promote vasectomy, mm-hmm. so is the tubectomy. But just a minuscule one percent, one point two percent. They're pushing it up and speaking as if it's a great. Where you know that's not a low hanging fruit. You know the STDs. Yes, it has to be with a double um, contraceptive protection. But there are two aspects in this. One is contraception and preventing unintended pregnancies. The other is prevention of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. The women should be well aware that no matter the second one happens or not, she should not. subject herself to a pregnancy by chance and not by choice so this she has to be very very sensitized and uh, uh, she not take that aspect easy because uh, the sheer number of abortions we can always not say that uh, uh, there was lack of access to care etc it is that the women are not coming forth to take a uh, um, preventive uh, precaution towards the pregnancy having said that the sti again the equations between the partners are going to be very complex very different we can't treat it with the same uh, brush but uh, women are being now more demanding it or more conscious of the fact that uh, uh, they are to make sure that uh, a barrier is used this is uh, more in case of multiple uh, sexual partners uh, especially in the um, adolescent age group where they tend not to use the barriers so that is the present situation and uh, as always i think the perspectives are very different from very many girls and women in many parts of the country what applies to one part uh, in the country not be the same as the other so need a lot more data from all segments so that we can effectively uh, you know uh, tackle different approaches to different segments and what we found also where do these adolescent uh, girls and boys seek information from because there is a lot said about the teachers and the parents but healthcare providers only 5% of them are actually seeking information from authentic information from healthcare providers 80% is from the uh, internet and any kind and some of it from the peer group hesitant to talk to the teachers and the parents uh, so either they get no information at all they don't have access to uh, the digital uh, platform in an unorganized way or uh, they certainly don't come to us for <laughs> that information so all our gyan which we give <laughs> on <laughs> sexual and reproductive health unless we reach out to them there's very little happening uh, we have not facilitated comfortable way of them reaching out to us so again in an anonymous way um, the yudos and such kind of platforms where uh, we can maintain the confidentiality and be really really non judgmental because this also senior order obgyns i'm afraid to say have their own kind of thinking and they can't come to terms with the kind of questions that are posed by the uh, generation next so uh, that uh, needs a, a little sensitive kind of uh, tackling so uh, both with respect to abortions and uh, sexually transmitted diseases i think uh, uh, we have a lot of scopes to this both from the women themselves right right but uh, that brings me to another question which uh, somehow uh, i have been thinking over a lot over that male contraceptive use is uh, is not very good it's not high in fact according to me it's dismally poor although uh, there is a lot of stress on that and a lot of uh, Uh, advertisement and marketing goes for male contraceptive products and there are very few products which are in the hands of women one of them being the female condom hey maji it never took off and even i speak to many women uh, in the urban areas many of them have not even heard of it at least in india it didn't take off it uh, in in some uh, so why is it so shouldn't uh, women be having more uh, user friendly basket of choices which are in their hands to use um uh, shobha ji overall uh, the cafeteria approach what we keep on uh, saying it for a contraceptive basket mm-hmm. even amidst that there is a huge unmet need yes. why is it that they know about it still they are not getting on to the use of it that is the reality because almost every woman knows about the oral contraceptive given a choice she doesn't want to use it which is not 
you know, convinced that it is safe or she knows perhaps that it is safe, but she still doesn't get it. So all the usual methods of and contraceptive devices, the injectables, the condom, the uh, pills, all of these, which she already knows very well also, the usage can be scaled up to more than 20, 20 times more than what it is now. That is one aspect of it. The newer methods, they will have to cross the mindset barrier, the supply chain and availability. They go to the healthcare provider and ask Then you know, just because we don't think highly of that or we don't know much, it's very you know, biased view from the healthcare providers as well. I don't think we sensitize them enough to say, this is another option that uh, you could use. So it is, uh, it's like pieces of a puzzle. Everything and everybody is responsible for a suboptimal use of many of these methods, not only the female condom, but also the very, uh, you know, methods which are running in the forefront, even that can really be scaled up yes. multiple times. Yeah, yeah, rightly so. And as you mentioned about vaccines and like the HPV vaccine, so even uh, uh, methods which we have or the uh, uh, vaccines which we have, they are also not affordable and available for all. Yes. Uh, likewise for pneumonia, pneumonia is preventable, but look at us, we are having... Uh, uh, the, one of the highest number of deaths of children under five due to pneumonia. And you rightly mentioned also that it is different at different places. We, I would not hear of a child dying of pneumonia, say in my family setup, or as you said, in, in Bangalore, if a woman needs that sort of uh, specialized help and care, she'll get it. But what about the rest? So accessibility and affordability of what exists is also yes. important, I think. Absolutely. You know, the HPV vaccines also, I don't know, you know, uh, collectively, if we make noise and put up a strong case that uh, this is an available vaccine, so kindly make it available in all places and let's enhance the volumes and bring down the cost because uh, uh, if it is there and women are not aware of it or they cannot afford it, we are again losing a chance to uh, contain a dreaded um, uh, disease just because uh, the cervix exists only in a woman. Exactly. Uh, participants, you just have the last chance to put in your questions if you want to, because we are running out of time. Uh, we have a question from Saida Deep. And Saida Deep says, thanks, madam. Very impressed to learn more on Manita. Great example and scalable too. Uh, she wants to know, are all deliveries institutional now? And also, as your work is so essential to human life, how did you and the other gynecology fraternity cope with the added challenge of COVID-19 and how are you still coping with it? Yeah, so there are two parts uh, to a question. One is, yes. are many of the deliveries institutionalized? Yes, I yes. think uh, financial incentives are the ones which brought a huge number of deliveries to the institutions. Mm -hmm. So the mindset of the women have changed and the families have changed that they need to bring her to a hospital. Mm -hmm. The mindset of being scared to go to a public health facility for delivery that may still be existing in some pockets and they want to somehow save the money and somehow spend out of pocket because they think that in private um, hospital care may be better because they are paying which to our dismay we discovered in the Manita program that it is not so there are so many clinical based protocols which are you know slow monitoring and they are not following the norms uh, even in the private settings so that's how the program has really helped to strengthen the quality so institutional deliveries um, uh, now if you see i think we have uh, reached a feasible scale uh, in uh, many many parts of the most parts of the country and even in the rest of the poor or very very interiors they will seek help under some roof because uh, like a home delivery or a non-institutional delivery is really you know to the mindset of women this era is not uh, very acceptable in the covid crisis yes in covid many things came to a halt not the menstruation and not the childbirth okay the un said that in the next eight months india will be one of the countries which has largest number of births, 20 million births are to happen in the next eight months. And we are not seeing COVID anywhere going away in the next couple of months. So we have coped and we still have to cope because it is declared in the disaster management as a 
essential service in a pandemic because it is indeed an essential service. So what we did, at least in the state of Karnataka, was capacity building is our like, hardcore from our organization hmm, artist, Asian Research and Training Institute for Skill Transfer. Every single day, two batches uh, from on the Zoom platform for teams of 2020 hospitals because for many staff nurses who got scared, ran away in small places, Tumkur, Gadag, Davangiri, this, that. So half the number and also the gynecologists were pretty much, you know, apprehensive what to do, what not to do. So the entire guidance of infection prevention control practices, how to manage, how not, COVID, non-COVID, testing, and also uh, as to uh, how we have to look at every patient as COVID suspect or COVID positive unless proved otherwise and take universal precautions like how we used to do for the HIV patients. All these, you know, the repeated dialogues, sensitization, strict, uh, doable protocols like housekeeping all given raincoats. So that's such a, uh, such a cost effective way of uh, giving something impermeable to them. So all these were also not only the training, but within one week, they have to send us the pictures how the security is wearing a mask, how his hand sanitizing, and uh, how no patient is allowed to enter without a mask, how only one relative has to come in, and how the distancing in the OPD has to maintain, how should be the conduct in the consulting, you know, everything. And they used to send us the pictures within a week. That was a mandatory part of the course. They have actually implemented this in practice. So now what has happened, that's become a norm. So now <laughs> they're all, you know, at it quite... Um, effortlessly so this is now scaled up this uh, short component of a training program has scaled up everywhere and i think it has built not only their competency but also the confidence that yes we can and so uh, i think that, the, that is you know that's why i said each one doing our best bit and the uh, foxy has uh, brought in some good clinical practices recommendations and we are tying up our international organization figo to produce a pregnancy COVID registry because we really need to set the way forward and about the HCQ uh, and its uh, role. We are doing a survey and things like that. So a little bit, as I said, all pieces together will set the way forward. So it has been a challenging time, but uh, I think it's also an opportunity to change the way we manage uh, things with the calls and, uh, uh, you know, shift in uh, the schedules uh, as such to keep with the uh, what is expected as do's and don'ts yeah mm -hmm. thank you and the, the chat box is uh, full of messages complimenting you uh, hema ji so i'll just read a few of them raksha parmar says very informative and important talk thank you dr hema madam and pushpa shrinivas says very lucid talk to create awareness mm -hmm. and uh, before we close we have already overshot the time before we close, can I request uh, for one take-home inspiring message from Hema Ji? Uh, for women as well as for men, you have brought about a lot of changes uh, locally, nationally, globally. So one take-home inspiring message from you before we close. Yeah, but each one I feel should follow the mantra of each one, teach one and never give up. Because whatever little you have made a difference even in one person whom you have shared something bit by bit it'll go a long way and anything in this large complex country and this huge big world will take time to bring about the change because as Gandhiji said be the change you want to see in yourself when i ask everybody you want to see the change they'll say yes we want to see the change but do you want to change no no hum to theek hai. like we're okay as we are you know but how will things change yes. you don't <laughs> change yourself bit by bit so work towards as i said from passion to purpose and covid has taught us all to lead a purposeful life a minimalistic life a life recognizing our limitation and life full of opportunities for the future. Let's all pledge to make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Charity begins at home, as you have said rightly. And this, with this, we come to the end of today's discussion. In this session of SDG Talks, co-hosted by Indian Institute of Management Indore and CNS, 
we were listening to dr hema devakar on preventing illness and promoting wellness for girls and women and we really need many more dedicated people like her and more programs like manita of uh, of the asian research and training institute for skill transfer of which hema ji is the ceo mm -hmm. our sincere thanks once again to dr hema devakar for her very very insightful presentation thank you very much thank you namaskar everyone thanks for your kind attention thank you ma'am thank you thank you very much